One day you may have something simple you're dealing with. Another day it can be the total worst. So that's what happens and that's why it's important for me. I, I take it seriously where I do debrief. Even if it's after a very draining session, if I know that there's a colleague that's like we have accountability bodies basically. And if I know I can pick up the phone and say, listen, yeah, I've had a bad session. Um, this is what has happened. I just need to vent or it was taxing on me mentally. And that's what I do. And that's how I cope at the end of the day. Because I mean, if I had to go, go to bed without doing that, I'd most probably land up in the loony bin. <laughs> Mental wellness within the communities and seeing what society has to face on a daily basis. I think that's where what drew me more to it. Um, and just wanting to educate people that as much as we worry about illness and like the physical aspect, nobody realizes what role that plays on your mental health. Hi everyone, welcome back to Zen and Now, your go-to source for wellness, mental health and healthy living. I'm your host Kishan Morar and today we have a, a special guest with us today. Uh, Bhavini Dalpat. Bhavini is the owner of Bubble Out the Box and a certified wellness counselor dedicated to helping individuals, young and old, to find balance and healing through accessible mental health services. She's changing the game for mental health, mental wellness. Stick around as we dive into Bhavini's journey, insights, and tips on living a healthier and more mindful life. Welcome to the show. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. So, Bubble Out the Box. Where did it originate and how did you uh, how did you come up with the name Bubble Out the Box? So initially, um, the goal was to study medicine, but uh, that didn't happen. So my second option was psychology and got into that, did my undergrad. And after doing my undergrad, obviously, the field of psychology to find jobs is very scarce. Um, so I did a lot of volunteer work, helping out in the community and, you know, just trying to get a bit of experience. And right. through that, I obviously then registered through the ASCHP to become a certified wellness counselor. Um, but obviously, Bubble Out the Box was founded before then. It was founded in 2017 while doing work within the communities. So I'd assist with the local community policing forum where we'd assist with trauma incidents where it's an accident and you know people require trauma counseling or domestic violence and guiding people on how to open a case what needs to be done what's the procedures and protocols to follow um removing girls from drug houses that sort of thing and obviously it's it's where i realized that i do have a passion for what i do and then as much as it was a free thing at the time, you realize that it doesn't pay the bills. So at some right. point I decided, okay, I need to now focus on building my practice and, you know, making it affordable for those who can afford it, but still doing what I can do for the community. That's the amazing. name, the name. So I played around with a lot. How I got to this name, I'll be honest with you at this point, I don't remember, but it stuck. Um, and I think it says a lot about who I am as a person in the sense of I'm never somebody who stays. What's the right word? I'm not somebody who stays in a box. I like to think out of the box rather. And I always try to find a solution. And if I know I can't find it, there's definitely somebody who can help. Somebody else. Right. Right. Okay. That's interesting. It's yeah, like you say, it sticks bubble out the box. It, it stems from so much of like aware, like, uh, and not to put this, but it, it it's such a such a unique name, but it's like what we're all going through right now. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, we we're living outside of of our bubbles right now. You know what we what we actually. I mean, myself growing up in Indonesia, you know, we live in a little bit of a silo because of you know our history and you know the history of the country, and now coming outside of that, living away from that community, you you kind of like living outside of the box. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, amazing. And your pro bono work, I'm sure that was like so fulfilling. How did it how did it feel like, you know, when you 
I know building a practice, you know, it takes time and stuff, but the pro bono work is, is as much as important as your, as your, you know, your practice clients. Um, and I'm sure like a lot of people also need that, that outlet, because let's be honest in, it's not cheap also to, to see a therapist in this in this day and age. Uh, so to do that work, you know, I commend you for it. It's, it's truly, truly amazing. And, uh, you know, we need a lot more people out there actually offering their services, you know, in both spectrums. Definitely. And I think, you know what, it's why I said it's a passion. You have to be passionate about this. Like, it's not for everybody. Not everyone's cut out for it. So I know a lot of my colleagues, some of them who can't handle certain situations. And if I mention something, it's like, something that they're not comfortable with. So if I have to say, for example, I'm dealing with a missing child or kidnapping, for me, it's actually become second nature. Right. And I say that not in the sense of I've normalized it, but I've just learned how to deal with it. Right. You cannot get emotionally attached. And I learned that um, very early on while I was still doing my undergrad, when we did a bit of ComServe, and we were dealing or rather working with terminally ill, ki terminally ill kids in a hospital. And the one child actually was in remission. And next thing, he was full-blown cancer throughout his body. Wow. And doctors still said, no, by the time you guys are done, this child will be okay. Anyway, long story short, that was not the case. Um, at some point, he got admitted because he did his health did take a turn. And he was in a ward, pipes, monitors, the works. And the group of us, there was about five of us at the time, we came together and we understood that a child shouldn't be in that situation. So the agreement was that day we all would go home and go and get something small that this little boy could play with in the ward on his bed. And I obviously came home and the first thing I did before I even reached home was go to the shops. And I, know, I don't know if you know the small Hot Wheel cars. Yes, yes. So I went and I bought him a set of that and I still said I'll go in a bit earlier the next day. Right. Anyway, went in a bit earlier and as I walked through the ward, I can see the mother crying and I'm quite confused at this point. And when I asked the nurse, the nurse said to me that I was literally five minutes late. The boy oh, had no. passed away. And I couldn't even see the mother. I couldn't do anything. I went back upstairs and I said to my supervisor at the time, I cannot do it today. We can wait for the rest of the team to come, but I need to be excused. I got home and... I realized that I cannot get emotionally attached. Like you need to know where to draw the line. Oh, yeah. And since then, I've just taken that approach. It's not saying that it's a cold approach because I can relate, I can be empathetic, but I know that I can't get emotionally attached. So you deal with different clients on a daily basis. And like you said, pro bono, pain, but some cases not everyone can afford the full fee and mm -hmm that's where we can negotiate. Some people just phone for advice and I'm open to giving it because you know when somebody wants the help. If somebody wants the help, they make an effort. So you don't yes. mind helping. Right. No, that's, that, uh, that service is, is, is truly, uh, you no know, lacking in today's practices. Um, I, I know a lot of people, I know the companies, the corporate companies offer that free service, but you also have to be an employee to access those, uh, yeah. those services, yeah. whereas now bubble out the box, you know, offers those to everybody, um, uh, whether you can afford the full price or if you know what you, what you can afford, which is, uh, I think a lot of people would actually like love to have that, op have that option open to them as well. Yeah. Yeah. And going back to your, you know, you said you're not, you don't, you, you distance yourself or you, you like remove yourself, uh, from feeling, you know, too close to the incident. Um, you know, just I had went through the list of your services and uh, you know just types of trauma counseling, and I see you do like like there's a lot of deep and uh, deep traumatic uh, experiences that people go through. And you know, for yourself, how do you f how did you practice to like remove yourself? I know it's it's not like just a, a one day thing. You probably had to have some form of like training. Can you run us through like what form of training you had to actually like take yourself? You know just to feel all those things so i don't think I'd, i never necessarily had any formal training i think it was something i learned 
through experience. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, something that I do consistently is that I debrief. So I debrief with other colleagues. And I do that because as much as, you know, people think that you can cope, it's the same like doctors in medicine. Mm -hmm. They see different cases on a daily basis, but you don't know how that affects you. One day you may have something simple you're dealing with. Another day it can be the total worst. So that's what happens. And that's why it's important for me. I, I take it seriously where I do debrief. Even if it's after a very draining session, if I know that there's a colleague that's like, we have accountability bodies basically. And if I know I can pick up the phone and say, listen, yeah, I've had a bad session. Um, this is what has happened. I just need to vent or it was taxing on me mentally. And that's what I do. And that's how I cope at the end of the day. Because I mean, if I had to go to bed without doing that, I'd most probably land up in the loony bin. <laughs> yeah, they say therapists also need therapists, right? Or counselors also need counselors. Because at, at the end of the day, you, you're absorbing all those energies. It's, it's taxing on your mind and just your body as well. I mean, we've gone for so many, I've done so many Reiki sessions and therapy sessions. And when you come out of it, you're mentally exhausted. I can just imagine uh, the counselor or the therapist on the other side has to do this for so many other people and, and listening to so many different, uh, you know, scenarios. So that's a, you know, it's, it's, it's good that you have that, that, that uh, outlet. And in today's, uh, in today's world, like, What's the general type of of trauma or mental issue, mental health issues that you you're seeing in your practice? So it ranges, hey, it really does range, and I think because I deal with different ages, it's different across the different ages. And amongst the teenagers, one of the biggest things that we are faced with is suicide, or rather, suicidal thoughts or self harm. So, and that's a lot between your puberty ages, your grade eights, your grade nines, 13, 14. And it's mostly girls where they attempt to cut themselves, those sort of things. And when you ask them why, mm -hmm. it's now I wanted to know what it felt like or I'm tired of life. So it's it's come to a point where the younger generation doesn't necessarily have resilience anymore. It's not mm -hmm. like where before you knew that if something had to happen, pick yourself up, dust yourself and move on. It's yeah. not like that anymore. So that's something that lacks. Um, parental involvement is a big, 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 big void at the moment because you see it with the kids where parents tend to just throw money at their children versus spending quality time with them. So there's no discipline anymore. There's no morals. There's no values. So kids are basically, I don't want to say going off track because they don't know what the track was to start with yeah. because they weren't guided in that way. So that in that sense, that has changed a lot. Society has has changed. I think it's more societal change in the sense of we're becoming more westernized. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then obviously on the on the adult side, it's a lot of divorce. Divorce is a big thing at the moment. Um, nobody really tries to make it work anymore. Um, and the strange thing, it's not the older generation. It's the younger generation mm -hmm. that's just gotten married and two, three years into the marriage, no, I don't love you anymore, or I'm not happy with you, or I found somebody else. It's that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, I, we were just chatting about it, this exact same thing, which was said last night, and um, the ability to, to see things through. You know, we, the resilience both. I think we had, growing up in, you know, the 90s, from 80s, 90s, uh, we had good people behind us to actually guide us. Uh, we had tough people, we had empathic people. Our teachers were pretty, you know, pretty good at that. I would say like me growing up in the sports environment, I had pretty good leaders. I had uh, mentors. I had pretty good people telling me, okay, this is what you need to do. If, if things don't go right uh, this way, find another way. You know, mm. there, is, there isn't just one, one outlet. You can find ways to, to get through things. But yeah. I, I, I agree with you in this, I call it the digitized age of, of, you know, growing up and people are so, so much more in tune with information or have access to information. Yeah. Uh, it becomes just too much where when our days we just had 
if we needed information, we had to go to the, we had to walk to the library. We had to actually make an effort, you know, to go and get it. 100%. But these are with encyclopedias. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's where probably why you're seeing so many more uh, adolescents. Because everybody wants to fit in, right? In your adolescence years, it's about fitting 100%, in. 100%. 100%. It's not it's, about yeah. fitting in. It's doing just, these trends and yes. who's doing what better, yeah, or who's got what and they don't have it. It is. It, it really is. And unfortunately, technology plays a big role in it. Before we continue with today's episode, if you're enjoying it, if I could ask you for a small favor, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. It will not only help the channel grow, but it will also allow me to bring you a lot more guests and a lot more experiences. Thank you. Back to the show. And like you said, also parental involvement is also yeah. very minimal. Uh, in Because uh, they probably also don't understand why. You know, the why. Why is my child doing, or why is my... Why are we going through all of this? It's because you would say, just get over it and move on, where it's not the same anymore. Yeah, but it's also this new concept of what they call, because this is what I've been told, gentle parenting. Okay, and what does that entail? What is in So, according to what people have said, it's basically not doing what our parents did, um, the total opposite way. I don't want to say entirely protecting your child but obviously it is the concept of my child can do no wrong and it's always blaming the next person for their behavior and trying to sugarcoat the bad behaviors by justifying it not taking account about it nothing exactly so there's no consequences yeah okay no no repercussions for that action it's just Mm. it's not my it's not my child's fault it's the other external factor yeah Yeah. okay yeah how do, and how do you how do you cope with with kids that are just have you seen any success you know, in your with kids who actually like come to you do they progress so they do i won't lie but the only time you see that is when there's involvement from a parent so generally the kids that are that come to me it's because a parent has brought them out of concern that's why otherwise generally not because then when you when you see, and you know when you can see somebody wants to be in a session versus they don't want to i mean just yesterday i had a client that was brought to me and the mom said to me she doesn't talk much and that's not the child i seen in the session so i was like okay obviously she doesn't have the right people to talk to so that makes a difference it's sometimes sometimes we fail to realize that all they need is just somebody to listen that is all okay yeah i think they it's just that safe space where they can express how they're feeling at that point in time you know yeah no it's it is it is it is a pandemic well it is an an issue in in the today's age but not just just not just adolescents i think our our generation as well between like 30 and 40 it's uh or even beyond where you're saying a lot of people are just not sticking with something that's a bit, you know, yeah. a bit challenging. Um, but uh, I don't know where we, <laughs> I, I, it's difficult to see a, a way forward actually, because everybody wants the instant re- uh, gratification now, you know, and I feel like we, we, we actually going backwards instead of forwards. You know, so, and in, and in your terms, you know, bubble out the box, is it just, is it just yourself or do you have uh, other wellness practitioners as well? So it's, it's just myself, but obviously I do have a network where I can refer to um, other counselors, psychologists, OTs, your speech and hearing therapists, but in, within bubble out the box, it is just myself. Okay. So let's, I just want to go back to, to you and how did you, how was, what, what was your upbringing like, you know, um, where did you grow up and how, what was like the, the point where, you, where mental health, mental wealth or health or wellness was, became a passion for you? So brought up Job Work South, um, in a fairly, I would say I, 
morals, values, you know, still Indian culture. Obviously, my parents had moved out of the old Indian areas, um, and they were like one of the first non whites in our area. So I think that played a role. Um, in school, I'll be brutally honest, I never had an Indian friend. So for me, that was normal. For me, it was always mixed. You know, I didn't I didn't know what it was like to be in a predominantly Indian environment. So even growing up, if I had to go to Lanasia or Lodium, it would feel very awkward. Not in a bad way, but just because I knew that I don't necessarily fit in because of the environment that I come from. So we were, right. I would I would say I was privileged to that, to a certain extent that I was allowed that opportunity. Um, mental wellness, you know, if I have to say where it started, I, I cannot pinpoint. I'd be lying if I tell you where it started. Um, but it was, so obviously, like I mentioned, medicine was always my first option. Um, but I'll be honest, matric for me was a game. Like I didn't take my matric year seriously. So I had to settle for my second option. And now like when I see matriculants, I'll tell them, just put a little bit more time and you'll see the difference. Because obviously I know if I did that, I would have obviously been somewhere else. But I also feel I am where I am because I'm supposed to be here. Yeah. So it was my degree, my undergrad, and I think more so working within the communities and seeing what society has to face on a daily basis. I think that's where what drew me more to it. Um, and just wanting to educate people that as much as we worry about illness and like the physical aspect, nobody realizes what role that plays on your mental health. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're working in a stressful, toxic environment, it's going to play a role on your mental health. It's not just going to affect you physically. So I think in that aspect, it's more from what I've seen happening daily and the challenges that people are faced with. No, the two are interlinked, right? Because when you're feeling stressed, your body feels it. And when your body is tired, your mind feels it. 100%. I know for myself, when I'm like anxious or having an anxiety uh, experience, my body feels it. You know, I, I don't have the same kind of energies. Uh, mm. My body, I, 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 feel, I feel like I'm, I'm losing a lot of weight. You know, that, that's me. So the two are interlinked. And I, I, I agree with you when you said uh, people like m the misconception that the, the mind is not as strong as it is. It actually is controls everything. It is. It the is. The entire neural network of your body is controlled by your mind. And, and the one thing I want to, want to point out is you said you had two options when you were studying. I think that's so important because a lot of people just have their primary their primary uh, option and when that doesn't work then there's nothing else to fall to fall back yeah. on so and do you see that more like in terms of like the adolescents and who actually like want to get to a, or pursue a certain career and they they like they put all the eggs in that one basket so currently i think it's it's on two completely opposite spectrums here the adolescents of today or the teenagers that i see today it's you get the extreme where okay we want to study certain things but it will be three different options in three different faculties altogether so we look at medicine accounting and let's say marine biology so they're not even related we're looking at complete different things on the other side you'd have these teenagers that are no my parents own a business and there's money there so i'm going to take over because i'm i've got this it's my inheritance okay. but i think where the fault there is is that inheritance does not last forever right. and not everybody is business minded so if you can't pick up the reins and run with it it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work mm -hmm. And in, in I, I strongly feel that in today's times, it's important for anybody to have a qualification of some sort because it opens doors. Um, your metric doesn't give you much. It's not, it's not as valuable as what it used to be back in the day. I mean, I'm sure you know our current pass rate is 30%. Yes. So that says a lot. It says a lot. And it's scary because that's literally what our youngsters aim for is just to pass. Because that's all they need. Yes. No exceeding expectations or trying to push themselves beyond that. 
Exactly. And I think with that being said, you'll find that a lot of them don't even have ambitions to study at a university or to go into further education because they've settled for the bare minimum. So there's no drive to do more. And do you think like the whole influencer influence is taking over? To a certain extent, I would. So, so I also work at a school as a school counselor. So I see a lot of this. And it's also that culture of my parents are there, you know, they'll say to me, or I'll find a job because we connected. I know somebody that knows somebody. So that's, that's the concept that they have. Okay. And again, I say, you know, as much as we say, no, it's okay, you don't need to study, you don't need to go to university. But what do you do with the 30% in maths, for example, or 30% in business, where does that take you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not far. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It really doesn't. And I mean, you know, it's evident when you go sometimes into the universities. I mean, even if you go into some of our government facilities, you'll see some people cannot even read and write. We have an issue at the school currently. And Keeping in mind, I am at a private school. We have issues where we have grade eight learners. So that's your 13, 14 year olds that can't read and write. Wow. Because they don't have the foundation. Wow. And that and, and that then leads to what you're saying in your practice. Exactly. And not just that. Remember something, our system, our education system says learners aren't allowed to fail. So all we do is progress, progress, progress. Even if they are not coping or they're not meeting the bare minimum, they're just being progress until they get to matric and then what? Is that, well, that's new for me. <laughs> I mean, I'm, we've, we haven't been in, haven't heard that before, but is that what it is now? It's just progressing. Yeah. So you, a learner can only fail, I think, once or twice a grade or once a grade and twice in the, same um oh, what's the word in the same foundation basically okay so that's 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 the whole concept but then too your department will come and say to you adjust marks you know so that oh, they can be promoted okay. they can be progressed and unfortunately it also comes back to parents because parents don't want to no they wouldn't want to accept that their kid isn't doing well yeah, yeah. But there's also there's two parts that like the the parents' responsibility and the teacher's responsibility. It's just as much as the the parents' responsibility to actually make sure that the kid is actually you know looking after his education as just as much as it is the teacher who is actually imparting that knowledge on you know. So I think those days are gone. <laughs> <laughs> Those things are gone. That's why I said parental involvement is close to zero. Parents, if a teacher has to pick up the phone and tell a parent, parents will say, when they're at school, it's your child, not mine. Wow. So you deal with them. Now, given the fact that new age parents are our age, I mean, you know, the between the the eight, the the, the 80, 70s, 80s, 90s kids, the, that's the new age parents right now. Um, Given what we've under, what what we've learned, I mean, surely that should have been some form of parting knowledge of how to navigate life. But or is it that we, we uh, is it that you're saying that uh, parents are now uh, comforting and you know hugging kids too too close to the heart to not go through those traumas that they did? But you see, now here's the thing: it's not necessarily comfort in that sense. It's the wrong form of comfort over it's like overprotection it's, it's become a monetary thing it's become a very materialistic form of comfort what do you mean so, so to find a parent that just would hug a child and say it's going to be okay is very rare you don't get that it's not like i know we it's not like we had it easy growing up i'm not saying our parents did that but i think what's gotten worse post covid is that everybody's just trying to make a living so that's what we're pushing because everyone's too scared of losing their jobs or finding something better. So that's the priority versus the kids. Oh, okay. I see what you mean. So, okay. I, I see what you mean. Makes sense now. So the, 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 the neglect from the neglect is from one part to the other. 
and that's where you're seeing Basically. a lot of these a lot of these kids and a lot of people struggling with with their their mental wellness nowadays because they just don't know what's going to happen and remember something a lot of these kids are now from broken homes because parents have split uh -huh. so kids like that know how to manipulate either parent because they've learned and because the parents aren't necessarily on talking terms the child knows what to use when with which parent uh, okay okay subconsciously controlling both sides of the narrative yeah. to get their way yeah and it works believe me it works i mean it must be like pretty challenging for you i mean to navigate or to like help somebody come away from that thought and and start thinking for themselves so it depends remember something if it's a teenager you can still assist because i mean they know the difference between right and wrong when it's much younger it is a bit more tricky but that's why parents then need to sit sit down together and come up with a plan whether it's a parent a parenting plan or whatever it is but they need to be on the same page it can't be one is saying red and the other one saying blue and i think that's that's where the loophole is is that the kids know that this is happening let's be honest the children today are not naive they mm -hmm. are quite they're quite aware of what's going on. So they can see when their parents aren't on the same page. I mean, if if a child goes to the parent and says, no, can I do this? Mom says, no, dad says, yes. They're yeah. going to know who to ask. 100%. Yeah, we see it. I see it a lot too as well. Where, uh, one parent is on the other, one foot and the other is the other. And then the kid will like, the kid feeds off that. And they're like, exactly. no, okay, this is where I can get where I want. Whereas yeah. if like both, both parents are on the same foot, the kid knows how to stay in line. Yeah. And then you reduce the amount of, of, how do you say, uh, I want, you know, the I want phase. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit of a scary, like, time to be, uh, it's not scary, but also a, 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 a good thing in my eyes, because we actually like starting to bring all of these issues up to the surface, whereas before it was just under the rug, never talked about, never spoken yeah. about. And, taboo. Uh, it was taboo before. Yeah, and a lot of now these platforms are out there. We, we speaking up about it, um, also going through our own challenges, our own demons with who we're dealing with. Mm. But the more we speak about it, the more we get it out there. I think we we give we try trying to give that generation a bit more uh, of the easier rope to pull. You know? Remember what that being said, our generation. So like we said, seventies, eighties, nineties, they trying to break generational trauma. That's what they're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, 100%. That's that's the word, generational trauma. And like, it's interesting, I was listening to Trevor Noah's podcast the other day on Diary of a CEO. Mm -hmm. And uh, he stated that, you know, we're all just pieces of porcelain that have been cracked or broken and are trying to put those pieces back together, you know, just to try and look or feel good again. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh but you're doing an amazing job, I must say. Like it's not an easy thing to to uh navigate somebody away from a from a traumatic uh, you know incident or experience and to guide them to the light. And um you know we need more of more of that in our societies. Do you see, do you feel like like we're getting there or do you feel like we still have a long way to go? To a certain extent, yes, but there's a very long road still ahead, very long road. And I think, you know what, as much as I may do what I do, there's, there's a need for more people in the sense of being passionate about it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people go into it with the idea of becoming a psychologist and just collecting that money at the end of a session. It's not that simple. Um, you need to be hands-on. You need to actually develop a connection with the person, develop a relationship so that they can also feel that you're actually actively engaging with them. And I think that's what's more important. And it's something that in general, we don't have anymore. I mean, how many people actually have patience when people go to the shops, for example, and the cash is slow, you can already see they're frustrated. People have lost the patience. Hypersensitivity to, to get things done, the rat race, so to speak. Yeah. So is that where you feel, I, I feel like my own experience, just to 
give a bit of context is growing up in Joburg, South or Southern Asia, Gauteng, whatever it is. And growing up in that fast paced world where, you know, you wake up 5 AM or whatever, you get ready, you go to work in this, in the, or you go to school, you know, you come back, you got your extracurriculars, whatever it is. And then you get into adulthood after school and then you get, you have to travel and it's constantly moving. You constantly be moving, you know, mm. there's no time to rest. Um, even when you do get the time to rest, your mind is still racing. Where when we moved over to Canada, we actually had to slow down our, our, our pace of life, even in the workplace, because coming from South Africa, you know, you hustle, you, you make sure you get your, your tasks, done. Yeah. Uh, whatever projects you have going, you make sure you get it done at a certain time. And you also expect that from other, from your, from your colleagues. Whereas over here, we've learned to like slow down a bit and also take the time out for ourselves, knowing that it was, you know, life is not going to stop because you can't get it done. You have to look after yourself to actually get that, that job done. And we've actually now, even if it's even in the winters when it's like a little bit colder, yeah, we make sure that we even go outside for like five, 10 minutes just to, mm. just to reset ourselves, get some fresh air into our bodies and then come back. Which is important. It's very important. And I think what, what people have failed to realize, and I say this to a lot of my clients, is that me time is important. As much as we're busy trying to make a living, seeing to the family or meeting tasks, deadlines, whatever it is, taking time out for yourself is so crucial. People tend to overlook it, but you don't realize that while doing everything else, you lose yourself in the process. So when I sit with a lot of clients and I ask them, but who are you? Nobody can answer because they don't know how to answer that question because they've lost so much of themselves. And it's important, whether it be a hobby or sitting for 10, 15 minutes, an hour, reading a book that you enjoy, just something for that, that moment where it's just about you. Yeah. I think the word also, or the feeling comes as comes to mind is selfish. People feel they're selfish for giving that, giving that, that time to themselves, that they should be just giving themselves away to the, to the world, so to speak, you know, and coming from our societies, you know, it is when, when people are just sitting idle, what are you doing? Are you lazy? Why are you sitting on your, why are you just sitting and doing nothing? You're yeah. supposed to be doing something, you know, whereas in fact, did you ever ask the person, how are you feeling? Is, is it something that you're going through or you just, you know, you need a five, 10 minutes? Sure. And that's where patients come along. We need to understand that we need to give that side of the of that person, that, that opportunity just to like, you know, decompress. And we need to be supportive. I think that's, that's, that's important to be supportive of each other. Everyone's entitled to have a bad day. I mean, nobody's going to have 365 good days. It's impossible. No, it's non-existent. <laughs> that doesn't exist. There will be even throughout the day, you probably feel like you'll be happy at one point, and then the next exactly. minute, you're like, "Oh, you know, your your your, your mood changes." Mm -hmm. So I guess this this persona or this perception that we have that we should be perfect all the time, and also should be eradicated because nobody's perfect. You you could be perfect at being non not perfect. You know, and the impact and of it comes. It comes back to self acceptance. I think if you, as a person, accept yourself wholeheartedly, self love, then you wouldn't worry about everything else. So yes, family is important. Your partner, your kids. I'm not saying no to that, but it's important to focus on you first. And if it's one, if people want to label it as being selfish then that's what you should be because it's, you know, the saying goes, there's no point filling someone else's cup if yours is empty. Yeah. I always use that analogy of the plane, you know, put your own mask on first before you help somebody else. Exactly. Yeah. You have to have your own, you have to own your own oxygen filled before you can give yourself hundred percent of yourself to something else. And I think a lot of, a lot of our mothers actually also have done that. They've, they over they oversell themselves in the, in the household well and also our, our parents also like one was one was the home the homemaker the other one was the the, the financial provider mm -hmm. and you know that was it you know so 
and the impact of it is is on the is on the, the kids and the impact is on generations after that not saying our parents didn't go through anything they probably have their own traumas which they've then imparted onto the next generation because yeah. it was never dealt with at source and remember their traumas was never spoken about because yeah. those things were taboo you don't speak about it you deal with it and remember now that you also mentioned one was the breadwinner one was the homemaker those roles have reversed mm -hmm. it's no longer like that so now you'd see the wife being the breadwinner and husband's the house husband as it's as it's labeled so i think that also impacts a lot because things have changed it has and do you feel like like that's where teenagers are are molding themselves against especially like you said girls are like they now they thrust it upon this you know they call it boss babe uh uh era where they've got to be like ceo they got to get to a ceo level they got to get the money they got to do everything and they're putting so much pressure on themselves that they they just they just can't handle it so it, it it to a certain extent yes you know i've i've seen it and like certain clients that i've i've spoken to especially the male clients they'll say that you know what the working environment is becoming a bit tough and when you ask why and automatically when they tell me that the person they report to is a female. As a female, I'm not saying, no, I don't agree with women being in power. No, there's nothing wrong with it. But what we fail to understand, there's certain aspects in a workplace that does not need an emotional approach. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, women were built that way. They are going to be emotional. Yeah, it's just gener it's just biological. That's, that's exactly. the way it is. Exactly. Now, you can't have a male figure under you expecting him to understand your emotional approach. It doesn't work. So I think as much as females feel that they need to be, like you said, in this boss babe culture, I'm not saying no to it by all means. Yes. If, if someone's capable of doing the job, give it to the male or female. Yeah. But also with that being said, understand that your home environment and your professional environment are two different things. Yeah. It's about, finding the balance. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I asked this question to everybody, uh, cause it was put towards me and how do you, where do you find, or what is your perception of work life or that, that concept? What is it? What does it mean to you? <laughs> Many people are most probably not going to like me for saying this, but no, I okay. strongly, I strongly advocate that when you start work, by all means, yes. But when you knock off, that's the last of it. I don't see the need to be working after hours because you, it, it, it filters and it ripple effects on your home life, on your relationship. So there needs to be that balance. So if you have a eight to five, then work your eight to five. Why are you bringing work home? So I am that person. I do not bring work home as in for my permanent job I don't bring work home ways bubble out the box yes that I do but that's because I have flexi hours so, so that is different but I mean normal you need to have a cutoff and it's not just for your families or for your for others around you but for yourself you cannot be eating and breathing your work because it's going to affect you mentally it really will I mean I have a client funny enough she spoke to me today and she's in quite a demanding role. And it gets to a point where she takes work home, but she has like a two-year-old child. And when she sat in with the powers that be, they said to her, no, why doesn't she hire a nanny so she can focus on her work, a loving wow. nanny? And I thought to myself, okay, wow. that's definitely their solution. Wow. I think that I think she needs, she probably needs to find that balance of, and also stand up for herself and say, you know what, look, look if you want me, if you want me full hearted here, I've got to be hundred percent at home. You know, I've got to give myself but remember something post COVID or during COVID, the demands were very different. So remember, because a lot of people were working from home, uh, they pushed hours. So no one had a work home balance. It was just uh -huh, work, yeah, work, yeah. work, because we forgot. So that culture has become normal because people are still working from home. Some people are still at home permanently. Some are in and out every alternate day. So it hasn't really made things any better. Uh, and because there's no travel time, 
to go to work, people expect, okay, so because that's out of the way, you can do a bit more work. It's an yeah. expectation. We've, we've, yeah, we've pushed productivity yeah. over the edge. Yeah. Whereas now you could be on call 24 seven. Doesn't matter. Even, I mean, you connected via mobile, you know, you can connect any from anywhere. You have email on your phone. You probably have teams or, you know, whatever mm. I am on your phone, you are constantly connected. It's, it's that, I mean, it notifications uh, constantly pinging. I mean, where's your mind focused at one point in time? You know, I used to, I used to be like that. Whereas I had all social media uh, notifications coming through on my phone or my watch, whatever, but I decided, okay, let me just turn them off, you know, and I just have the, uh, the, the general, the general notifications coming through because at least I know when I'm, when I am going into my social media, that's when I'll see the notification yeah. and then interact with it there, you know, fully focus yourself in that, in that task at that point in time, and then go to another, which is, I struggle with till today is finishing a task and then going on to the next because my mind is so it's so busy 24 like i i that's why I, I incorporated yoga and meditation in my my life because i needed to slow down i needed mm. to learn how to just sit and be with me otherwise i was just all over the show and it's important and i think that's where your boundaries come in what's what's okay and what's not okay as an individual, you have to establish that as to what am I okay with in the workplace? What am I not okay with? And it comes back to, yes, as much as you need a job, you can't be a pushover. Yeah, it's about setting boundaries, right? It's once you, once you, it's once you let somebody manipulate you, that's when you lose your power, you know? And it, not, it should never be that way. We always ask ourselves, like, what did we do wrong to that person or to that entity mm. to make to 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 make them treat us this way? Why? Whereas you know you've done all that you can, you've given so much of support and love, and you're not getting. It's not like you should get anything in return, but obviously you ex, like respect. Respect is is respect earned is respect gained. Yeah. And I think we also need to do that with our mental health and physical health. Respect your mental health just as much as we respect our physical health. Because the two go hand in hand. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, from, from, a, from an impact, from a progressive impact or progressive stance, like where do you see, where do you see the trend of mental health uh, within, your own, within your own experience? Where do you see it going? So I think more and more people are open to talking about challenges that they are faced with. So that's a good thing, you know. But I think it still comes back to educating, educating people on the fact that it's okay not to always feel okay, you know, to understand that you, you're allowed to feel a certain way. There is people to talk to. So I think it's basically breaking the stigma around it because I know the stigma still is there where if you go to a therapist, you go to a counsellor, it means there's something wrong with you and it really doesn't. So I yeah. think it's still breaking in that, but we are moving towards a more healthier mental wellness space because people are more open and they're more, they're more inclined to ask for help. Like it's not as bad as what it used to be before where people wouldn't at all. Right. No, that's a good thing. Mm. Progress. I think the progression is there. A lot more people are speaking. Uh, expressing how they feel, especially the the male counterparts, uh, whereas females always yes. had that that emotional side where they could express how they feel, which is which is also exceptionally exceptional because in a relationship, when you when both express how they feel, it's just healthier. Even if it comes across as a bit argumentative or or a bit heated, but at least the the the, the way you feel is coming out. And how you yeah. like you cannot control how the other person feels about it, but at least you get it, you you getting it off your chest, and you expressing how you feel, which then bodes well, because like you said, a lot of divorces, a lot of separations, because they don't express how they feel. Hundred percent, and that's why you'd see now. So I've been seeing that a lot of couples in counseling, and it's simply because they've forgotten how to communicate, so they prefer having somebody as a buffer. And when you sit with them, they'd actually look at each other and be like, but we could have just told each other this. 
So it does, it does make a difference. And it's not to say that all marriages will fail. No, it doesn't mean you go for counseling. That's your end result. No, sometimes it's something so small that's made you drift. I mean, children is one of those things. Children actually, I'm not saying they create a witch, but because generally the mother will focus on the kids, she forgets that she has a spouse. So that's what's been mm -hmm. happening. So it's obviously breaking that as well. And obviously learning how to communicate better. It's, Finding healthier ways to communicate. Do you do you feel like one way to communicate is actually writing it down and handing it over to your spouse if you can't express it verbally? Hundred percent, yes. Yeah. Sometimes it's a better option because remember, if two people are complete opposites, where one person is like, "Okay, we have an issue, we need to resolve it now," and the opposite person is like, "No, I need to process." Them arguing it out isn't going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because a lot of people aren't very, because they get nervous when they get into situations. They don't yeah. actually then express or verbalize, you know, uh, punctually. They don't get their words out. They mumble. Uh, I'm like that. Like I, I need to like literally be calm to like express. If I if I'm in a if I'm in a zone of just like uh, argumentative and that that's it. I can't really, I can't really mm. think. It becomes a bit of it becomes a challenge. So that's why you have to like just take a few breaths. Deep your, deep, you know, just settle yourself down and then yeah. really listen to what they say. Exactly. Uh, and sometimes it's okay to take time out before addressing an issue. And that's what people fail to understand. Yeah. Patience, right? Like you said, patience as well. Yeah. So is there any like techniques or, or, you know, ways to people that you've, you've, you, you, express or you've given that you know it can help somebody else listening to this podcast going through what they going through at this moment you know, just general general techniques or general things that it can do just to help them along so i think the, the most important thing is that if someone is faced with any challenges with their mental wellness is reaching out to somebody because there's many people that would assist and i mean you know the fear of judgment is there but People that are within the space, they will not judge you. They cannot judge you. It's complete strangers. So they shouldn't have that. They're unbiased. So I think it's knowing that there is a safe space and knowing that whatever you're going to discuss remains confidential. There's no way that confidentiality can be broken unless obviously they harm themselves or they are harmed to somebody else. But other than that, it's safe. And, and there's nothing wrong with speaking out. It actually takes a whole weight off your chest it does mm -hmm. no thank you for that i'm sure a lot of people listening would probably not have that you know knowledge and now that they do so thank you for that oh, you're welcome um and just to go back to your own journey um i know that that you said medicine was and medicine and psychology were, were on your radar um do you still use medicine today to to help you along your, your journey? No. <laughs> no. So to all the doctors that are there, <laughs> forgive me in advance. I'm not that person. So luckily where my offices are based, I'm I'm in our office space with doctors, and thankfully we all share the same the same ideology with that. Um I know a lot of people do turn to antidepressants, but what I've seen with a lot of clients is that as much as they may be on them, it doesn't resolve anything. It just hides whatever they're feeling. So when they do come off it, it feels like they've been hit by a train simply because now they don't know how to deal with the emotions because right. they've been suppressed for so long. So nope, I generally would say rather not. Um, let's deal with what's causing you to feel that way. That's okay. what's more important. I'm not saying it's a complete no. Because in some instances, I do understand it is necessary, but not in all cases. Okay. Just a side note, I, I take antidepressants, but I also, I, I, I do a lot of my own work on, uh, while I'm on it. So it's not, I'm totally dependent on it. Okay. Uh, because I know that's not the end and, and all. Because I, I went through a phase where I did win, I was weaned off, mm -hmm. but then I, I had an incident and I had to be put back on, but it was my own uh, my own uh, decision because I knew at that point in time I needed it and 
it's a, it's a journey. So I have to, I have to stick with it. Uh, but you're, you're right. It's rather if you, if you, if you can avoid it, sure. But if you do need it, make sure that you're also doing the work on the, on exactly. the other side of it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. It's, it's not just that you're given this tablet and it makes everything disappear because that's the misconception. Oh yeah. Cause the tablet takes what? Six, six weeks or so to take effect. So there's a lot and it also happen. depends. It depends what you're given. That's the other thing because some some medication may not agree with you. So then it means doctors have to play around with medication. Yeah. So it is it is something that also has to be tried and tested. Yeah. Like I was given. Uh, I went through an episode of of depression, uh, and I was diagnosed uh, by a psychiatrist, and she gave me antipsychotics, which she shouldn't have. Um, and when I went for a, a follow-up with uh, another psychiatrist and he was, thankfully he, he probably saved my life um, <laughs> because he was like, you don't, you don't really need that. And mm. he gave me the correct doses that I needed, you know, just to be on an antidepressant and that helped me along. So like you said, it's, it's, it, it, it's very uh, touch and go. You have to go to the right person. You can't just go to anybody. Um, and you got to just be aware of, of the, the, the person that you're sharing with as well. Yeah, no, 100%. And like, obviously with mine, what, what I do, I can't prescribe any medication, but I can recommend herbal stuff that may work. So that's what I would do. But obviously, if it gets to a point where you see no progress with somebody, then you'd have to refer them. Right. Yeah, I mean, you guys, you guys know exactly where, where a person or person is in there in their yeah. journey, you, you probably uh, prescribe something, you know, appropriately, like you said. I mean, there's a lot of over-the-counter stuff that you could take, you know, to calm yourself down, herbal medicine. Also, there's a lot of, you know, all, all the spices that we use every day in our food <laughs> contributes towards that. Yeah. Uh, all the holistic stuff. And there's so much, there's so much of resources out there now. I think we've, we, we are making good progress and we, no, we will get there. Definitely. And that's why I also started this journey is just to like, you know, listen and get people's opinions and how they feel, where their journeys are, you know, real stories in life where, you know, it could help somebody else and, you know, we never know. No, definitely. And it will, I mean, even if it reaches one person, it's one person that wouldn't have known something before. Yeah. I'll share with you a success story from this podcast is that uh, I interviewed uh, a, a Reiki and holistic practitioner as well. Um, and I know I've known her since childhood days, you know, we were also born and raised in Indonesia. I went to the same schools and actually a friend of mine also was in the same class as her actually needed healing at the time. And she didn't know she did this. So he, like in, in, you know, inevitably the two got reconnected and the one is getting the healing that, that she didn't know she could get from somebody that she could trust. But it goes to show how many people you can touch and it's, and it's so close to home. You wouldn't even think that something like that would happen. No, exactly. Yeah. Um, advice. Somebody who's actually thinking about going into the psychology, wellness, psychiatry, uh, psychiatric, uh, profession, what advice would you give? So in South Africa, in the South African context, I'd suggest that they do the full extent of research that they can, because it is a long road ahead. When I say that, obviously, when I got into it, I didn't know better in the sense of to actually become a psychologist, you need to have your master's and to get into master's in essay is very difficult. And that's the only way to register with our Health Professionals Council. The only other way to become a registered counselor with them is if you do a B-Psych, which is offered only to, through two institutions, Cornerstone and SACAP. Okay. And unless you come from a very wealthy home, those fees are very nice. So I think it's just do your homework, but be passionate about it when you get into it because it is a long road. It's a long road and... The job market and all of that is not as fruitful as one would like it to be. 
Okay. So you have to have patience. You have to have patience and you have to have the drive to want to be in this field and be a people's person. Okay. Not, not, uh, don't be shy to, to get into the, to the dirty work, like they say. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you for that. I'm sure a lot of people, especially kids and, and even adults like who are wanting to change careers. That's a, that's some good, uh, good knowledge to have. Um, and bubble out the box. Where do you see bubble out the box going? So essentially I do want it to grow. Um, it is something that I want to see myself doing permanently, you know, at some point. And I think it's just making an impact on lives. That's, that's why I see it. Not just for my gain, but for other people to gain, whether it's knowledge or conducting workshops, whatever it is, but knowing that there's a safe space where somebody can reach out. I think that's the most important thing for me. Okay. And where can people get in touch with you? Uh, so I am on all social media platforms. I can be found on Facebook, Instagram, um, TikTok, those sort of things. And there is my contact details is on there as well. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave, I'll leave the descriptions below for this podcast, uh, to Bhavini's uh, practice. And, uh, yeah, guys, if you, if you ever feeling the need to, to reach out to somebody, uh, she's like, she's definitely somebody you could, uh, she could trust with your, um, with your experience. Um, but I asked this, asked this question to all my guests, um, at the end of the podcast, um, what's next? What's next for, for you and, you know, just you, what's next for you, not your practice and what's next for you. <laughs> I think, I think the world's my oyster. So I, I always love, I wouldn't say I love, but a famous saying is that, you know, you die once, but you live every day. So that's, that's me. I'm that person. Um, currently I am completing my master's. So I think that's my big thing. Other oh, than that, I'm seeing where life takes me. Oh, and life is, life is, life has been good to you so far. Touch wood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like they say, love in the now, right? Love in the present. amazing oh but thank you Pavini. i really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your journey and experiences and and, uh, and thoughts uh, i think this will, will help a lot of people out there um and i wish you all the best in the future and um, i can't wait to see what bubble out the box uh you know does also thank you and thank you for having me no you're welcome until the next one guys ciao bye bye